Uh, okay, well, it's 11.01, so I think we're going to get started with our seminar. Uh, I'm very happy uh, that David Ruglicki is here. Um, as part of the contract negotiations in arranging the seminar, uh, we agreed uh, by contract to read this paragraph. Uh, born in New Jersey, David Ruglicki received his Bachelor of Science in Atmospheric Science from Cornell and then both his uh, MS and PhD in meteorology from Florida State, where he worked with Krishnamurti, uh, Paul Reeser, and Bob Hart. Uh, then he worked at Fleet Numerical Meteorology and Oceanography Center in Monterey for three years, during which he transitioned the NAVGEM Ensemble Forecast System and designed a variety of tactical decision aids related to crisis management situations, such as the Syrian Civil War. He then transitioned to the Naval Research Laboratory, where he focused on developing the atypical rapid intensification theory. Uh, he also is the core developer of the Navy's next generation modeling system, the Spectral Element Neptune, implementing below ground extrapolation and designing the preliminary input output user interface. Uh, owing to his and his family's desire to move back east, he took a position with the technology and science branch at the National Hurricane Center, where he helps to maintain the data flow of NHC and works on developing forecasting aids related to his research and the forecaster's needs. In his spare time, he enjoys playing bass guitar, which he's been doing for 20 years. So. Uh, all right, uh, obliga contractual obligation is fulfilled. Uh, so anyway, uh, David is here. Uh, a lot of us have known him for a long time in the hurricane business, and uh, he has this really cool ideas about rapid intensification. So we're going to hear all about them right now. Go ahead, Dave. Thank Please you very much, Dave. <clears throat> Dave. All right. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for that wonderful introduction, Dave. Um, I am David Riglicki. I'm gonna be talking to you today about atypical rapid intensification process. And on my title slide, I have a, a ton of acknowledgements. Um, one I gotta shout out, kind of because he's here, but a big help to, through all this has been uh, Dan Hodes, who's now at NRL uh, DC. So uh, just so many people have helped throughout this and I, it wouldn't have been possible without um, a lot of their assistance. So uh, let's get to it. So a motivation of this, was uh, motivated by a stated goal of the ONRTCIDRI, which was stated that tropical cyclone intensity is primarily influenced by internally forced outflow. Now we know that increasing values of vertical wind shear lead to more uncertain intensity forecasts for tropical cyclones. And improving the understanding of tropical cyclones and shear is a key goal for both the Joint Typhoon Warning Center and the National Hurricane Center. So this is the, this is the motivation for what we are doing, what we're doing. Now, generally, uh, TC intensification is thought to follow a few rules that Bill Gray laid out you know, in 1968, and we haven't deviated too much from that, but generally speaking, if a TC is going over warm SSTs, encountering low vertical wind shear, high low, high low level relative humidity, and high upper level divergence, it's probably undergo, undergo rapid intensification. Um, a, atypical rapid intensification violates two of these expectations, specifically shear and divergence. And as we'll talk about, the there are choices made in shear calculations that remove a key effect. And it's also why statistical forecast aids can miss this effect. Uh, the Dvorak satellite technique uh, also misses these effects. So this really is a, a brand new thing that current understanding just uh, wasn't able to handle. As an example was a 2016 Hurricane Matthew. And at, uh, on the slide here, you'll see in the x-axis is date. On the y-axis is intensity and then shear magnitude, and the gray box is from genesis to uh, when the eye appears. And if you look at these shear values, somewhere between 9 and 12 meters per second, like normally you'd expect this is not going to intensify. OK, thank you, sweetheart. Can you back what? Sorry, again, my kid has pink eyes. So anyway. Um, so these shear values are high. They're about two standard deviations greater than the rapid intensification climatology. So, but Matthew didn't really seem to care, just kind of blew through this anyway. And if you look at the intensive, uh, the uh, forecasts of Matthew at this time, no models had any idea this was coming. And if you come to the last forecast here, hang on, let me put a laser pointer on. There we go. If you come to the last forecast here on September 30th at 6Z, RI of Matthew is basically right on top of all these models <clears throat> and nobody saw it coming. So TCs like Matthew in these conditions are notoriously difficult to predict. Uh, some other ones, which we talk about a little bit, they include Joaquin from 2015 and Dorian uh, from 2019. So, all right, so what do I mean by classic versus atypical and what makes atypical atypical anyway? 
So classic RI theories usually begin from model-based studies in quiescent environments. Uh, Vikuyama's cooperative intensification mechanism, uh, Wishy, Mike Montgomery's rotating convective paradigm. Uh, generally, these are all bottom-up development pathways uh, that are done, you know, either axisymmetrically or or things of that nature. Uh, atypical RI, on the other hand, requires vertical wind shear for it to happen because it, it messes with the vortex in a specific way that if it's not sheared, you're just never going to see it. Uh, the full part is that it causes the TC to tilt, which changes its thermodynamic structure, which changes precipitation, which causes further structural changes. You get development of mid-level center. <clears throat> and possibly the most important part is that outflow aloft from the, from the tilt modulated convection blocks the environmental flow, reducing the shear, thus permitting vertical alignment and a vortex merger. So that whole mouthful is atypical RI in a nutshell. And in picture form, uh, a little cartoon here kind of show the, the multiple moving pieces, and there are a lot of them, and we'll try to hit all of them, is that you start with your original level of circulation, and then the tilts, which is these two lines here, kind of corkscrews with height, and these, uh, this uh, transparent shading is the projection onto the surface from the mid-level center, which has a thermal anomaly because of the tilt. You'll see that precipitation is up shear left. And then at the very top, when this convection erupts out of the TC, it actually produces a very specific kind of outflow that blocks the environmental winds. Now, when it comes to the environmental winds, you need a wind profile that sort of looks like this, where the strongest winds are confined to the upper levels of the atmosphere, because blocking is not going to work unless it looks like that. So again, this is there's a lot going on here. So for the rest of the talk, we're going to talk about uh, observations first, and this is kind of think of this as like a forensic meteorology thing. There are going to be a lot of clues and pieces that we try to put together to figure out exactly what's going on here. Um, and then we'll move on to a modeling study where we try to tackle this as an, in an idealized model. And at the very end, we'll try to use a simpler model to break down one component of it, and specifically the outflow blocking uh, component of it. Because like I said, this, this process is very complicated, and, and I've been trying to find ways to at least pull apart pieces of it and simplify it. Um, so right here is Hurricane Hernan. This was a storm probably nobody else remembers, the fish storm in the Eastern Pacific. It simply does not matter. But this was the original storm that I saw that, that did this thing. And, and I'm going to require you to really pay attention to what I'm doing here. Um, so you're going to see on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off, on again. And then we're going to get the I. So uh, we're going to let this go one more time. And what you're looking at here is a tilt modulated convective asymmetry. These puffs that appear in one specific spot. So I just point out the shear this, at this point is coming from the, uh, I believe, from the east northeast at this time. So the shear vector is pointing southwesterly. Well, one more time, we're going to go on, off, on, off, on, off on, off, on, off, on again, off, and then the eye. Now, a very important thing. Does anyone not see this? Because this whole house of cards falls apart if you do not believe me that this is happening. I think there might be like a slight delay between you and the motion, but I, I see it. You see when it? When you say on, you mean like the, the actual puff, pulse. Puff, shrink, puff, shrink, puff, shrink. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So we're, we're going on. So to kind of do a little cartoon of this is that the features in satellite imagery can be used to separate classic RI from atypical RI. And the difference primarily is rotation versus classic. So on the, in each of these uh, pictures on the top is classic, bottom is atypical, your black arrow is your shear vector. And basically just say in shear storms, just greater than in you know, classic RI. And what statistical forecast aides are looking for when they look at IR is looking for this. They're looking for a very cold cloud you know, convective burst, for lack of a better word, that rotates around the eye, and your delta T here is about two hours. Whereas in atypical RI, you get a pulsing over one particular spot. Like there's no, very little rotation around. You also get uh, things that appear in the water vapor imagery, which we'll talk about these very thin arcs and warming and clearing beyond the arcs up shear. Uh, and to put this into uh, what it looks like in reality, we're going to pick two storms from the Eastern Pacific because the Eastern Pacific is like the best basin to look at, you know, idealized, as close as you get to idealized TCs on the planet. So on the top is Hurricane Rick from 2009. This became one of the strongest Eastern Pacific hurricanes on record. 
and you have this feature. You have cold, uh, each of these uh, rings are about 50 kilometers. So you have uh, minus 80 on the southern side, two hours later on the northern side, two hours after that on the southern side. So it did a full circumnavigation. Whereas in Hernan, which we just saw from the movie, it was pulse three hours later, it shrinks and then blows up again two hours after that. So fundamentally, that's the difference between what I would call classic RI, we normally expect stuff to do, uh, RI storms to do, and atypical RI, which is uh, this new thing that we're gonna be talking about. <clears throat> now, quantifying the periodicity. So it's, I, I like to think it's very obviously there. And uh, speaking of Dan Hodes, he and I struggled for quite a while to figure out, because you, you look at it and you're like, it's obviously there, but how do we pull out you know how how uh, how often it's happening. So what we did is that we uh, took an area integrate of uh, all cold cloud temperatures cold in the minus seventy degrees over the center of the storm. That's minus, we tried different thresholds minus seventy seemed to be what worked best, and realized we were getting killed by the diurnal signal. So um, came up with a low pass filter that removed that diurnal signal here. So the blue line is your total area, orange line is your diurnal signal. Subtract the two, you get the green line, which you cleaned up a little bit. Uh, the horizontal red lines are plus or minus one standard deviation of that signal. But I think you can see pretty clearly here that here are our puffs. And if you run a wavelet analysis on this, you'll find that these come out with a four and a half hour periodicity. And if you do this all these over these other storms, the, the pulsing range is between four and eight hours. And I think you see pretty clearly here that there were six of them. One, two, three, four, five, um, six. Now there's going to be a faster animation here. This is her. We're coming back to Hurricane Matthew. And you're gonna be looking at a procession as this, as uh, the cold clouds kind of move around to the uh, from the east to the north to the west. So the shear in this direction is is, is uh, west southwesterly, pointing northeastward. But uh, I'm gonna skip. This is a cool animation, but I'll skip this and get right to this. Another thing we came up with is just using a simple um, uh, brightness temperature centroid, where we just calculated the location of the coldest cloud mass, and you can actually um track this going back uh, in time. So it starts here on, on the 28th of September, and you can follow this thing as it gets pulled to the left of shear and up shear, so the red arrow is your shear vector. And uh, you can follow, you can track this uh, cloud mass in time. So we thought this was a really neat way of showing uh, this procession from what you get from uh, just directly from satellite ops. So that was something really neat. We'll, we'll come back to this later, what this is actually trying to tell you. So uh, the last, piece of information what we got tried to get from geostationary satellite imagery is water vapor imagery. And this is Joaquin. So the shear is northerly. And what you're going to start to see are these coherent arc shapes on the northern side of Joaquin. And wait for it. I know this is really intense animation, right? You should be coming out here. You should be seeing a pulsing, like these, these arcs coming out and extending beyond the cloud shield. Now you might be saying, well, TCs have arcs and clouds spewing in all different directions. Uh, these are actually, there's actually a very specific cause for these. They're to kind of prep you. This, these are trapped gravity waves um, in the outflow. And we'll get to why that happens just a little bit. And beyond that, there's some warming. And uh, the general feature here as we jump through that a little bit is it's there, there are two primary components, like I said, the arcs and then the warming after that. And in all of these images, I, I took some snapshots of some of the, the original six storms. And the magenta line is just to guide your eye. And, and the general feature you're looking for here is main cloud shield gap arc. In Hernan, main cloud shield gap arc. Norbert, cloud shield gap arc, cl uh, cloud shield gap arc, cloud shield gap arc, cloud shield gap, several arcs in Joaquin's case. So again, this is just another feature that I noticed. They're very slow moving. They're about, they have a width of about 20 to 30 kilometers. And the other thing is that beyond these arcs, is this weird clearing and warming. And the clearest case of this happening was in Hurricane Norbert, where the shear was easterly when Norbert was undergoing this process. So on uh, 215Z on um, October 6th in 2008, this is what, you know, Norbert's right here, this is what it looked like. But about a day and a half later, as Norbert was undergoing this process, you've lost all of these clouds. And this feature just kind of hangs out on the upshare side of Norbert as it completely goes through this process. And this is another thing that we'll be talking about as we get through the modeling studies. Similar thing in Joaquin. There's this beyond these arcs, which look uh, pretty nice here, uh, you have this thin crescent of warmer uh, brightness temperatures. So this is another thing that we're going to have to be thinking about. Like, why, do, why does this matter in the water vapor imagery? What is the water vapor imagery time trying to tell us? Even more, like I said, this is this. A lot of this was just 
forensic meteorology, trying to piece together all these, these different components and trying to figure out like what part of the story are all these trying to tell us. Now, when, when I was first doing this analysis, we, I was looking at different things like shear values, which we'll get to. But another thing I know is that all of these storms were sheared by upper level anticyclones. I know it's only six, so it'll, there'll be more, don't worry. Uh, but all of them were sheared by upper level anticyclones. And the, and the point I wanna draw here is that it doesn't matter where they are. So for Guillermo, the high is just to its north, Hernan to its north, Norbert to its east, Fabio to the north, Hill to north, Joaquin to the west. So where this high located doesn't really seem to matter. It just is this TC under the influence of an upper level anticyclone. And I'll point out that uh, this, these are not highs associated with what you'd expect of the outflow being pushed away, of like the upper level anticyclone of TC being pushed away. These are pre-existing synoptic scale upper level anticyclones. So why do we care? And if we can go back to some balanced PV studies from the Hoskins study, from the Hoskins paper, in this particular figure, what he did to make this figure is that he took a temperature anomaly of equal magnitude and just flipped the signs and the same radial width. I think it was 24 Kelvin, something like that. And on the top is the is a low, would be an upper level trough, and an H is your upper level ridge. And what I've uh, highlighted here are the isotacks, the wind, uh, the wind, uh, the wind contours. And I want to draw attention to 15 meters per second. So when there's an upper level trough, 15 meters per second in this in this balance case, um, your 15 meter per second isotack is down around 800 millibars. Whereas with an upper level anticyclone, that's up around 300 millibars. So if you just do a straight 200 minus 850, you might get the same number, but the vertical profiles are gonna be substantially different. And Joaquin being the only one that endured 10 meters per second shear per, from both sources. You know, if you look at the early times in Joaquin where it's being sheared by this upper level ridge, your strongest winds are confined to a very narrow layer right below the trophoplause. Whereas when it gets, starts getting kicked out to sea about five, six days later, uh, you have started filling in some winds in the middle levels of the troposphere. So fundamentally, that's the difference between the two. Oh, still more. The sheer magnitude also matters. So we, we took a look at all these storms and, and it, we have a, we picked out six different storms here, the original six. And again, gray box is Genesis to when the eye appears. Purple line is when RI uh, starts or comes close to starting in Fabio's case. And we took the two shear calculations from ships and the satellite-based one from the SIMS group, and we just averaged everybody together <clears throat> and you get uh, seven and a half meters per second. So, you know, there's variability here, you know, Guillermo, uh, the shear in Guillermo kept ramping up to 12 meters per second, Guillermo didn't care, Joaquin started at 12, didn't care, you know, Hilda was a little lower, Norbert and Fabio, were little, you just smear them all together, you get seven and a half meters per second. So I've shown you these six storms like over and over and over again. And while we haven't done any formal climatological studies, we have done a little bit and we pick some up. I've, I've been alerted, uh, Joe Courtney at the Bureau of Meteorology in Australia sees these things and points them out to me. So, you know, the preponderance of these we found so far are in the Eastern Pacific and it's primarily due to climatology is that during hurricane season, the Mexican high parks itself over Mexico and you're just more likely to get sheared by an upper level anticyclone in the Eastern Pacific. We had two this year already, Felicia and Linda, but it's not limited to that. We have some examples in the Northern Indian Ocean, Southern Indian, Western Pacific. I just haven't had the time or, uh, or you know, things of that nature to really do a formal climatological study. But it's not just these six, and I'm starting to, I'm starting to think that there's more of these out there, particularly after the Dorian study that we did. So I know I've thrown a lot out at you and I've kind of ripped through that pretty quickly because I really want to get to the modeling studies and really get to what all this means. But I, you know, we're, with the observations, like I said, I really want to drive home that this was a lot of essentially police work, you know, detective work, trying to figure out exactly what's going on in these things. And, and there's a lot, we have a lot of uh, boundary conditions here. We're trying to explain, all right, what's with this long, slow upshear procession of the cold cloud tops that we saw in Matthew? Uh, we have a convective periodicity of four to eight hours prior to the eye that we have to explain. There are these slow moving arcs in the water vapor imagery. And beyond that, there's warming and drying that stretches out very, very far. Uh, all of these TCs are sheared by upper level anticyclones. They're the strongest environmental winds we know are at the upper levels of the atmosphere. And the average wind shear magnitude is seven and a half meters per second. So at, at this point, um, I'm gonna take a, a little break and drink a, some tea, but. 
uh, if anyone has any questions just on the observations, uh, we got a bunch of modeling to come, but if anyone has any questions about the observations, like a real quick one, you know, fire it right now. Well, I just had a quick question. Uh, is there like a sheer magnitude um, where above that, this process sort of can't happen or have you not really seen anything like that yet? Yeah, if you want to see where this process can't happen, but you still get evidence of blocking, it just happened in Hurricane Henri in the Northern Atlantic. So um, Henri kept trying to pull itself together. And if you looked at the water vapor imagery, you saw the uh, disappearance of clouds and the warming in the water vapor imagery. Uh, but the upper level winds hitting Henri were 35 to 50 knots, which is way too high for what the outflow can, which we'll talk about, which is a little too high for what the outflow can handle. So no, get, being sheared by anti-cyclone anti does not guarantee that this is going to happen. It just, it's a, it's a conditional thing is that if it's being sheared by an upper level anti-cyclone, this is something you absolutely have to watch out for. Dave, there's a question in the chat. Uh, was Hurricane Michael a case that you looked at? Early on, yes. Yes, it was sheared by an upper level anti-cyclone. However, it kind of drifted out of that environment. Um, the Atlantic is very messy. Uh, that's just a, a truism of the Atlantic. So that's, I feel good. If you ask me about an Eastern Pacific storm, that's a very easy yes or no. The, the Atlantic storms are, there's a lot more conditional there. So Mike, Michael is a, is a maybe, is that it looks like it started here, not entirely sure it ended up here. Okay. Okay. All right. So let's move on to the modeling studies. Now, I am a huge proponent of something like this for looking at this in an idealized model. Because uh, as I hope I've conveyed, there are, there are a lot of moving parts here, and I'm trying to control just the sensitivity to the environmental wind profile. And I think that was the real big key here. So I used the CM1, um, used the Dunyan Moist Tropical Sounding, 27 and a half degrees Celsius SST is not too high. Uh, and we're trying to isolate the effects of the background wind. Uh, the Gaussian, the two Gaussian ones, seven and a half and 11 and a half, were meant to mimic excuse me, the vertical depth of anticyclones with a cosine one, which is, seems to be one that everyone uses, uh, is meant to mimic the depth of a trough. I should also point out all the winds are in geostrophic thermal wind balance. We did go through and derive an, at least an analastic approximation to thermal wind balance. And this becomes important, which we'll get to a little bit later. But yeah, we're going right for it. We're going for seven and a half, the parameters we just got, seven and a half meters per second anticyclone, we're going right for it. And uh, the model results, I think, speak for themselves immediately is that the control develops because the control always develops. But the Gaussian seven and a half uh, meter per second shear, that one develops, whereas the cosine and the Gaussian one do not develop. And I'll point out these are all started from the same initial conditions. We did do some little sensitivity tests, you know, 7.49, 7.51, whatever. Um, but the results are robust. Even if we tweak the shear just a little bit, jiggle it around those, these values, um, the Gaussian seven and a half developed, cosine seven and a half did not, Gaussian 11 and a half did not develop. So for the, for the duration of this talk, we'll focus on the Gaussian seven and a half uh, simulation because that's where all the interesting stuff happens. So, um, okay, it developed, but the, the curse of modeling is, did it, do, is it right for the right reasons? And that's, that's always some really, uh, one of the really hard things to, uh, to pull out. So we're gonna start subjectively, does it at least pass the eye test from, from, our, uh, from our satellite imagery analyses? And I wanna give a, a huge shout out and huge thank you to Yi Jin. I don't know if she's here, I think I, think I saw her, but, it, but she actually took the CM1 output and ran it through the uh, CRTM. And when I saw that, I'm like, oh, we got it. So a uh, big thank you to Yi Jin. So uh, at right, we're looking at, uh, I, I, the I infrared imagery, top four are observations. Bottom left is CM1 shear. Bottom right is CM1 control. Black arrows are your shear vector. And I've heard this described many ways, alien face, ear, D with a little tail, a kidney, whatever you want to describe it. Uh, the CM1 more or less does it. The, the white X is the low level center. Sorry about that. But the CM1 more or less gets a similar shape. So you might be saying, yeah, okay. And kind of sort of, you know, eye of the beholder, I guess. But now the water vapor imagery. So like I said, it's cloud shield, gap, arc. And we've got Hernan, Joaquin, and Hilda. So, and the cyan crosses are your low level center. So we've got cloud shield, gap, arc, cloud shield, gap, arc, cloud shield, gap, arc. And in the CM1, we have cloud shield, gap, arc. So the same feature that we saw in water vapor imagery, we see in the synthetic water vapor imagery from the CM1. Pretty neat. Now I've put on here uh, Rick, 
our, our favorite RI, classic RI storm from the Eastern Pacific. Uh, this has outflow basically in all directions. And the CM1 control, same thing, uh, outflow basically in all directions. Uh, we do quantify this a little bit more in the papers, but just for the purposes of this talk, just to move things along, uh, just qualitatively, did we get the two important features? Then so far, it seems that, yeah, yeah, we did. Now, under the hood, now let's go under the hood. When, it, as far as I'm concerned, with shear TCs, the most important factor is the evolution of the tilt because the tilt either processes, rotates up shear and comes together, or is completely pulled apart. Um, and there's some, there's some gray area here where you can sort of get a, a, mixed, uh, a mixed case scenario, Henri for one. Uh, but at right here is a case where it did come back. <clears throat> and I've color coded, so this is the, sh the relative tilt of the six kilometers. So it's just recentered about where the low level one is. And uh, I've color coded it by a time chunk here. So it, it, from zero, zero, it comes all the way out to 100 kilometers and then slowly begins working its way back. And I'd like to point out that there's, it's not just a straight shot all the way back. So it, see, it hangs out here at loiters then swings, then loiters, then swings. And so there's a higher order oscillation that's embedded in this larger tilt procession as it's being pulled back to left of shear and subsequently up shear. Now, as a brief aside, remember that cold cloud track I showed you with Matthew? Well, hopefully you remember it. Well, I want to show you that the a neat thing that uh, I would like to transition to operations is that in these cases, the cloud track is like an ersatz tilt calculation. Like obviously it's it's really almost impossible to know what's going on in the hood, but in the absence of all other observations, you know, if if uh, when I was working for the Navy, you know, a lot of our concern was Western Pacific, where there are, well, I guess until very recently, there are no flights. So a lot of their stuff comes from remote sensing. So geostationary satellite imagery can provide you with this kind of information. I, and like I said, I think this is a nice ersatz of what the tilt is actually doing under the hood. Okay, just a little aside. So like I said, the vortex tilt, there's the longer procession and then these little wobbles in, in between. And what you can do is take the tilt magnitude, which is the 600 tilt with uh, in the blue line, and you can run the same kind of low pass filter that we did for the IR uh, coverage a few slides ago. And you actually can back out the procession. Well, what's left over is this second oscillation. Now the fancy $5 word for the day, well, there are probably many of them, but one of their fancy $5 words for the day is nutation. And the fancy, the fancy definition is a periodic variation in the inclination of the axis of a rotating object. Simple short answer, it's a wobble. So there's a regular wobble here. And if you do a frequency analysis on just the green, on just the green, you get um, a periodicity of nine hours, which is a little longer than the four to eight, but to me, it's well within the realms to explain what we're seeing in satellite. And I, I've done this uh, spatially. You can see if you smooth, this is what the procession looks like in the orange, and then these wobbles out. So every time there's a wobble, it wobbles out um, when the TC is, bringing it, is uh, pulling itself back together. So, okay, all right, so we, so we kind of have an idea of what's causing these pulsings, that there's a second oscillation when a TC in these conditions is sheared. Now, um, that's all well and good, so who cares? That's, that's nice, okay. But the real, the real key here is that convection is localized under the tilt, and I think there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a misunderstanding when it comes to sheared TCs, is that prevailing thought is convection in sheared TCs is down shear left. And if you do a composite study, you smear thousands of these together, yeah, you're going to get something that looks like that. But the so while this is technically true, the physical reason for this, I believe, is that it's because the TC is tilting in that direction. So what you're looking at here on the right is um, various tilt calculations. Darker is lower, lighter is higher. And I think it's one, three, six, nine, eleven kilometers. That's what I picked out. Uh, contours are surface pressure, and the shading is your vertically integrated uh, condensate. So total condensate path or total condensed water of the column. And uh, all of your convection at this point is now up shear left, and it's under where the tilt is pointing. There's nothing going on. There's nothing interesting happening down shear left. Everything interesting is happening underneath the tilt. And uh, what's going on is that these are individual convective cells that are firing um, as they move through uh, the tilt and it corkscrews with height. So what is this? Okay, that's neat. So what is this convection doing? And this is the real linchpin of everything that's going on with atypical RI. Is at the fundamentally, the most important role of convection is to block the oncoming flow, uh, oncoming winds via, via the outflow. 
So what you're looking at here are nine different snapshots taken at different times in the evolution of the winds at 12.6 kilometers. And at zero time, there's no TC up there. So it's just, it's a straight um, easterly winds. But as convection starts to fire, you start getting local minima in the flow buttressed right up against this outflow. And the cyan cross here is to borrow an expression from Bernoulli flow theory is the stagnation point. That's the point at which the winds basically cancel each other out. So at 35 hours, you can sort of see that the TC is starting to pull, you know, starting to poke itself out. But by the time you get to 40 hours, you have a TC circulation up here and the stagnation point is pushed out, you know, what, 50 kilometers, something like that. At 44 hours, we're out at 100 kilometers. And then at 53, we pushed out to 200. Oh, I should point out, sorry, gray circles are uh, every 100 kilometers, their radius is every 100 kilometers. Sorry about that. So um, at 53 hours, we're at 200 kilometers out. 62, we're at 150. 68, we push out again to about 175, 200. So that's really what, that's another function of what this convection is doing is that it's building a protective bubble around the TC at very, very high altitudes. <clears throat> so this may be the most complicated and important plot in the whole talk. So we're gonna, we're gonna slow down and really dive into what's going on here. So at, it's three Hofmuller, the, the two Hofmuller and one line plot. So on the y-axis for each is time from zero to 144 hours in the simulation. And the x-axis, what they're showing is different things. So on the x-axis here is azimuth. This is tilt magnitude, and then this is radius. What we're looking at here is radially, what, what we're, we're looking at the um, radially integrated total condensate path. So we're trying to, at each azimuth, we're just integrating out all of the total condensate um, in that slice. And overlaid on that, we're putting the tilt angle. So if you want to step back and think about this, you're sitting at the low-level center, and you're watching the mid-level center with all of its convection moving in time. And as you can see, all of this convection is where the tilt is. So it's not, so once we get to, you know, down to your left would be at here, 225, this is math convection for the angles. And it's not there. After the tilt moves past that, the convection stays with the tilt. It's not, it's not down to your left, it's where the tilt is, all right? But buried in here, and you can sort of see this in, in, the, um, in the magnitude of the six kilometer tilt, you'll see that there are these big oscillations in here which correspond with these oscillations uh, laterally as well. So what all this is doing is that right here in the last plot, this is your radial wind in a 45 degree wedge up shear. So we're just looking to see how far out into the, into the environment winds that are coming at it, how far out are, is the outflow pushing things out. And up to about 42 hours, you know, there's, there's a little blocking. But all of a sudden, starting around 48 hours, which is when the tilt become, gets to left of shear, that's when you see these big blowouts, uh, the first big blowout. And furthermore, with these oscillations, you'll see there are corresponding oscillations in the outflow blocking. So what this pulsing is, so first of all, as it's coming back, it's, it's created boring a hole. And as these puffs are going on, the outflow that they're producing is pushing back against the environment and creating a giant protective bubble. And in this case, it's being pushed out to about between 150 and 250 kilometers, depending on the time, depending on, on where the wobble is, all that kind of stuff. So this is fundamentally what's going on under the hood and at upper levels is that as the, the storm is tilting, it's coming back, there's a second wobble. This wobble is modulated convection, it's throwing up outflow and it's pushing back against the environment. <clears throat> and now ultimately uh, this, the storm undergoes rapid intensification and these wobbles stop. And I would point out once these wobbles stop, you'll see that the outflow front returns back to 100 kilometers. So once these puffs are over, this effect is over. So after RI, this process stops. And that's what generally, and um, I know I went through the intensification pretty quickly, but intensification levels off at this point. So it doesn't intensify anymore. It goes through this RI and then it's done. Now uh, you can quantify this if you uh, calculate the shear explicitly. And this high, really highlights the main failure of operation of shear metrics is that they miss this block, this outflow blocking effect. And it's, it's usually one of two reasons. It's either the circle or the annulus that they use is too big or they remove the vortex. So when you read um, a sh the, the ship's output from a TC discussion and you look at that shear line, uh, the specific shear they use is SHDC from the developmental data. And what that is, is zero to 500 kilometers with vortex removed, specifically removing the divergent wind, which is, as we'll find out, very bad. But if you do a similar shear calculation where you don't remove the vortex, you include all the outflow stuff, 
Um, at zero to 200, you'll see that the shear actually drops to about three meters per second, which is well within RI climatology. So yeah, that explains exactly what's going on. And like I said, when the puffs stop, your shear comes back, intensification, sheet intensification ceases. And I, I'm sorry, so point out here that each of these colors corresponds to a different circle or angle. So zero to 200 is your small circle, zero to 500 is your big circle, 200 to 500 is your annulus from the 200 to 500 kilometers. Um, x-axis is time, y-axis is your shear magnitude. So again, driving home that when you use the smaller circle, you capture this outflow blocking effect, whereas the bigger ones, they hover around six to seven meters per second. They don't see this effect. Now, I, I promised you those water vapor rocks. I, I can't show you an animation, but we did do a calculation, and these, and these arc things do move with a speed of about eight meters per second. And so what you're looking at here is about 66 hours, the uh, total number of ice particles, the microphysics, at 12.6 kilometers, white X is your uh, low level center. And the magenta line is your cross section in B that we're gonna be looking at. So in, in B, which is a little bit more important here is uh, your black lines are your radial wind contours and your colors are your ice particles, but not the ice concentration. And if you look at this arc that we're looking at up here, it only exists in a very narrow two kilometer layer. And I, I wish I had more time to go into this, but there's a shear layer right below the outflow and the tropopause above that acts as a waveguide. It's about two kilometers deep. And if you plug in the values for the, I believe it's the group speed of a baroclinic gravity wave, vertical mode one, you get eight meters per second if you put in the values associated with the outflow. So for whatever reason, in this case, the outflow acts as a waveguide and that's how you get these uh, gravity. Now I should point out, these arcs are not, they are not the outflow front. They, they will break once this waveguide ends, but they give you an idea in satellite imagery just how far out the outflow has pushed. Again, in the absence of, for example, AMVs or something like that. And, when I, and there's still more, there's, there's still even more going on here is that this block just doesn't affect the TC near the core. This, the effects of the block stretch out a thousand kilometers away from the TC. So right here, we've got the winds at 12.6 kilometer height, 66 hours into the simulation and on the x-axis is your radius away from the storm so we're talking going out you know 1050 1500 kilometers and on the y-axis is winds and then on the right is pressure for the pressure line so let's just start way out here this is your um, radial wind from the environment so it's pretty constant this is the environment and then it gets to a point we're going to call this the bow wave it starts slowing down and this vertical black line is your outflow front when winds change direction well, if you look at the environmental winds, well, sorry, let's step back. The pressure, the pressure increases as you slowly approach this interaction, which you can explain using uh, some Bernoulli flow dynamics. But the TC winds, the effects, the rotation, the blues, the rotation, uh, sorry, the blues that are virtual, the green is the rotational winds. Uh, those extend out a thousand kilometers. But if we just focus on the uh, on the environmental effects, uh, your meridional velocity is in purple. You get a left turn. Because remember, like I, what I said is that we put, we actually put the thermal wind balancing in here. So if it's in geostrophic balance and it slows down, well, it can't balance the pressure gradient anymore. So it's going to accelerate to the left. And you also get sinking. So as, as these two flows collide, you get convergence. And since you're at the tropopause, can't go up. So this air goes down. So you get this weak sinking that extends out a thousand kilometers away from the storm. Yes, this is the Rosby deformation radius. Yes, yes, it is. So this sort of explains why we see this clearing in the water vapor imagery. So if you, for those who don't know, at least in the old days, for the old goes, uh, the weighting function of the water vapor, I believe was around three to 400 millibars. Um, Josh, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but basically the idea here is that as these two flows collide, they create a high pressure, the high pressure creates convergence, the flow starts to sink. Ostensibly as the flow starts to sink, it adiabatically warms. As it warms, relative humidity goes down, you lose the clouds. So fundamentally, I think that's what's going on here is that as a part of the block, there's this huge area of very slow sinking that occurs and that causes you to lose the clouds as this process is going on. Whew. So again, mouthful, a lot of moving parts. So I, I, I tried to do a, a little cartoon to kind of break down all the individual pieces that are going on here. So at the top, Oh, brain, uh, is the radial wind going from the TC center and then about 250 kilometers where it changes directions and then it slowly gets to the environmental value a thousand kilometers away. 
So if we start from the TC, you know, we have this convection pulsing, the outflow is pushing back out. Here's your outflow front, which is where the two flows collide. And then beyond that, you have the environmental, like an environmental deceleration region, which stretches, you know, a thousand kilometers beyond this block, which is where the wind, the environmental winds slow down, turn to the left and sink. And beyond that, beyond the bow wave or the Rosby deformation radius, whichever, um, you have your unaffected environmental winds. So the TC is actively changing uh, its environment. It's not just you know, uh, limited to right where the TC is. This is, this is a, you have 10 degrees of latitude, longitude that are being affected, wow, that are being affected um, by the TC going through this process. So I realized there's a ridiculous amount of moving parts here. We have tilt oscillations, we have convection pulsing, we have precession, outflow blocking, blah, blah, blah. like I know it's a lot. And one of the things we've struck, we or I personally struggle with is trying to find a way to, to at least pull apart some, like latch on to something and try and get a simpler explanation of physically what's going on here. So the one thing I, I wanted to go after was the outflow, because there's not, there isn't too much out there on the outflow. So what so we're going to try to do this in a simpler model, in a shallow water model, actually. And the, the thing we're going to take advantage of is how the, where this blocking occurs in the vertical. So at right here are trajectories of a bunch of parcels I launched uh, upwind of the TC. The you know, shear's moving uh, is easterly at this point. And I've launched them at 10.5 kilometers, 12 kilometers, 13 kilometers, 14 kilometers. And they're color coded by where the trajectories are in height at that time. So to give you an example, in these, all of these parcels start at 10 and a half kilometers, and as they interact with the TC, they're either going to go down or up, and darker colors down, lighter colors up. So at 10 and a half kilometers, just if you focus here on the up shear left side of the TC southeast, you see these parcels come in and then hook a sharp right as they get entrained into the primary circulation. Now some get down, get pushed down into the boundary layer, sure, um, and then they get ejected into uh, the outflow. So this is usually what you'd expect from a sheared storm. Parcels being pushed in, ejected in, uh, the, uh, the flushing, and then the, out, you know, the outflow, the whole, the whole thing. This is usually what you'd expect. But at 12 and a half kilometers, if you look to the, to the same spot, you'll start seeing some of these trajectories actually get pulled into this outflow jet. They don't, they don't get entrained. Now, as we go higher in the storm, only four of the trajectories get entrained. And at 14 kilometers, nobody gets invited to the party. It's all blocking up there. So what we're seeing here is that this blocking takes effect, in a, it takes, a, takes effect in a very, very narrow layer under the trouble clause, only about two kilometers deep. And it's essentially 2D up there, you know, minus that little uh, sinking that we just talked about. So what we're gonna do is try to simplify this with a shallow water assumption and do this in a shallow water model. Now, one of the key things that we did here was uh, we did a flow decomposition. We did a Helmholtz decomposition separating the divergent from the rotational components of the flow. And as it turns out, the divergent, it looks like, at least from the nonlinear model, that the divergent flow is doing all the heavy lifting. So you've got the divergent winds at 60, at uh, where at like uh, forecast hour 64 at 12 and a half kilometers, and the black axis is your low level center. So yeah, the straight line divergent winds are focused up shear where the rotational winds are more or less just along for the ride. So we're gonna use this flow separation to initialize our um, shallow water model. And these initial conditions is what we pull from the control simulation, the control psi field uh, in orange, the control chi. I'll point out in real, in real life for the real simulations, um, the chi field, the velocity potential field of the sheared storm is, has, is, has some asymmetry here. It's not necessary for this demonstration, just something uh, you should be aware of. But just for simplicity, we're just gonna pull the psi and the chi fields from the control simulation. And uh, we created some analytical uh, profiles that more or less matched. This is a gamma function, and this is a, uh, a Gaussian. And this was done in a spectral Fourier, Fourier sorry, Fourier non-dimensional, non-dimensionalized uh, shallow water model. So uh, these are the initial conditions of the height perturbation and the velocity perturbation with the total winds and the stream function. So they, they look reasonably reasonable. And uh, we ran this out to 130 hours and we hit it with a light background wind, 0.5 non-dimensional wind units or if dimensionalized just five meters. Like no one, at this stage, we don't wanna kill these things. We just wanna see what they do. So we ran a bunch of simulations. We ran psi and chi, you know, rotational divergent together, then just rotational and then just divergent. And we wanted to see what happens. And something really interesting came out of this. 
So at right are um, nine simulations. You have the control, like top line is sine chi together. I was just messing with the internal vortex. The middle row is no chi, no divergent wind, and the bottom row is no psi, no rotational wind. So the shading is your perturbation wind, streamlines total flow, green line is your zero radial wind, your outflow front. So um, the most important part here is that in the middle row, you have nothing. Now the vortex, like it's still there, it gets advected, you know, like four rooms down that way, but the rotational wind basically provides, you know, in a, in a limited case like this, not talking about vertical coupling, but in a little limited shallow water simulation as this, the rotational wind provides you with basically nothing when it comes to, it, it'll add some color to the flow for sure, but without the divergent wind, as we see here, um, you don't get any blocking. And that's really what gets at the heart of why that shear calculation that you see in operations that you use most often that removes the divergent wind is never going to see this. We'll never ever see this because it's removing the key component of the flow that actually is doing the blocking. Now, uh, we ran some sensitivity tests and we found a ratio to determine how far out this block occurs. Very simple ratio of your minimum velocity potential value divided by the magnitude of the background wind. This is, this, this is, this is like as simple as, as, I can, as we can boil this down to. And we did some analytical studies during the paper, but just for the point of this is that, you know, we, we held U naught constant, and then we just increased COP. There's some diminishing, which you would expect, you know, you increase the outflow, your blocking should increase as you go out. And then the bottom plot is, if you hold chi constant and you increase you not you increase your denominator um you start you start losing that alpha one so that's it it's 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 the race this is a simple way to quantify outflow force divide uh, relative to what the environmental wind is pushing on it now here's the really cool part if you take this ratio that we got from the cm1 when the, all those puffs were happening the chi over the u naught that is where the outflow front actually sits time average in that little in that chunk in the cm1 so using just a shallow water model with just the divergent wind there's nothing about moist convection shear profile nothing like that using just the divergent wind you're able to model and figure out exactly where this blocking is occurring in a full physics model i think that's pretty cool um well, dave you're just you're saying it, it's a result because the red x is on the curve yes okay yeah. Yeah. So so the so since the red cross is on the curve, it's just it's just saying that if you if you knew nothing else about the outflow about, about this TC, you just knew the magnitude of the velocity potential from the TC, which I understand is not an easily you know, it's not an easy thing to get, and the magnitude of the background wind, you can predict how far out the outflow can push back against the out the environmental wind. That's, those are the only two, those are, apparently are the only two values that you need to say something meaningful about how far out uh, the TC can build itself. So one more thing. Um, I know there's been, I, I threw this in there. I know there's been some, some discussion on the T-Storms list about um, shear versus non-shear, flow versus no-flow simulations. And uh, I want to draw your attention to this time series. So I took the minimum chi value and the maximum psi value for the control simulation and the sheared simulation. So the, the blue and the green are your sheared and the orange and the red are your control. So with the psi, these two sort of interweave as, the as time goes on, like the structure is gonna be different, um, but if you look at the chi, the, the sheared simulation is two times, one and a half to two times greater than what you get in the control. So that's the paradox here, is that to produce enough outflow, enough divergent outflow to block the shear, a TC must first be sheared and tilted. That's, that's the paradox here. That's why if you run this, if you just run a regular TC in, in a god box with no flow, you're never gonna see this. You're never gonna be able to replicate the kind of outflow is, that is needed to block the environmental flow. So I think that's, it's, you know, I, I've, I spent a lot of my time thinking about hurricanes and shear, and this is actually one of those things that you won't get otherwise without it. So um, to bring this back, I know Dave's running low on time, so I'll just skip over this. This is, I hope I've hit all these things. If you want further reading, um, Pete Black talked about this uh, back in 71, Russ Ellsbury did one. I went gangbusters and I no longer have this, uh, this lane all to myself. Someone did a climatological study. Um, 
summarize everything here. Uh, this will be in the recording. Uh, so basically, the idea is that outflow, divergent outflow, is going to block the environmental winds if the environmental winds are really shallow. And again, to point out, in order to produce enough divergent outflow to block incoming shear, a TC must first be sheared and tilted. Now, the one thing, you know, where do we go from here? I'm not going to read all these, but that Sheen Chen study, it's in review right now. I'm a reviewer. I identified myself. It should be coming out pretty soon. So I asked them, they did a climatology, 1990 to 2010 of, of TCs in, in moderate shear, high shear, and they looked at the outflow. And they basically, from a climatological perspective, showed everything that I've showed in this talk. So I asked them, all right, what is shearing these storms? And they came back and a whopping 76% of TCs at RI and shear are under the influence of an upper level anticyclone. Now this was subjective, they didn't do any PV, blah, blah, blah with it, but, if anything, the atypical RI isn't atypical. It's, it seems to be the pathway for TCs to intensify and shears to go through this whole tilt, wobble, convection, outflow, blocking, shenanigans, everything that I talked about here today. So it was a really exciting thing. I hope this paper comes out soon. It is, they do a really good job. And with that, I'm going to stop. So thank you very much for your attention if you made it this far. All right, let's thank the speaker. Uh, thanks, Dave. That was great. Uh, I just want to ask first. Um, okay, so uh, if your your chi value is the velocity potential, so are you actually saying that the during the intensification phase, the sheared storm has more mass flux out, more outflow? Yes. Uh, given given an equivalent low level intensity with a non sheared storm, a right. sheared storm will have more uh, will produce more divergent outflow. Now, vertical mass flux, you got to be careful uh, because how that divergence is created changes a little bit, whether it's sheared or whether it's not sheared. So we did, this didn't make it into part three and Dan and I are actually working on this um, a little bit, is that uh, the, if you do a divergence budget, the tilting term, you get a tilting term in the divergence budget actually becomes pretty big in a sheared storm that you don't get in a regular classic TC. Okay, but I mean, you know, to have alpha, it's like, I mean, there's a mass flux. Yes. Requirement, right, so you're saying your sheared storms essentially have more mass flux. I I don't know if it's more. It's 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 definitely faster because what's going on when the TC tilts, there's that cold anomaly, mm -hmm. and buoyancy and negative static stability has become a thing. So mm -hmm. even if the mass flux is like I never I, I haven't explicitly calculated this. But we tried it. I don't. Mm -hmm. I didn't look at it. Didn't, it didn't look good enough for me to actually put it in the paper. Hmm. But I think it's the fact that just that whatever's coming up is coming up faster, more vigorously, if you want to use that. It's just coming up faster, and that's creating more chi aloft. So it's not so much that it's more, it's just that it's different and more aggressive. Uh, okay, I think that's the same, but what's okay. that? Uh, <laughs> we can, that's we can, like, we can, I have, mean, I, we can, you know, we could definitely calculate it. Row, row V, right? It's right. Math flux is row V. So, uh, okay. Uh, are there any other questions for the speaker? Oh. Uh, may, I ask a question? may I ask a question? Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm Alex uh, from Nova, your good neighbor. Uh, uh, David was a very interesting presentation. And uh, of course, this exciting feature about four, eight uh, hour oscillations. Uh, I'm just wondering where it's uh, coming. Of course, uh, it produces uh, the tilting, wobbling, but it must be some uh, physical mechanism because oscillations develop when there is positive feedback in the system. Where this positive feedback would come? I have no idea. And uh, that's actually one of the cool things. Paul Reeser, if you're out there, you owe me some simulations. Uh, but yeah, no, the question is, why does this have, just from a strict fluid dynamics perspective, where is this coming from? Why, first of all, why does it happen? And why in this specific time range? And I, I wish I had, so I, part of my, I'm gonna give you a crazy man on the, on the corner uh, explanation for this. So I thought about this a lot. And the simplest explanation I can, I can come up with is like, think of the TC as a spinning top. And, you know, when you tilt it over, it's going to persist forever because the torque of gravity is going to continue to pull it in one direction. Well, in shear, you know, that torque is consistently pulling in one direction, which is where the TC usually ends up. But as I, you know, thought about this the more and I've looked into, you know, where do mutations come from? Uh, the angular momentum, just the straight angular momentum, the, the physics of it was a little too much for me to handle at the time. Like I've, I've spent more time with it. So 
the answer the answer is platinum zinc. I don't know. I that's that's a that's a major just basic fluid dynamics. I don't know. Mm. I don't know. Yeah, that's a very good, uh, of course, uh, question for future research. But uh, great that you were able to clearly identify this type of oscillations. Yeah, yeah. very interesting. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, let me say I, I got to go right now. So, uh, Dave, just you can continue to take questions, and and everyone uh, have a good time. Thank you, David. I'll see you later. All right. Thanks, Dave. Bye. -bye. Yeah, then I take it over from here. Do we have further questions? If yes, uh, activate your microphone and camera. But if there is nothing, I can just say thank you uh, for the nice presentation. Uh, thank you all for coming. We recorded this, so it will be available on YouTube sometime this evening. Our next seminars will be given by Henry Potter of Texas A&M next uh, Wednesday. And then we have the first three 15 minute student presentations next Friday. The students have not sent me their abstracts so far. I don't know what's going on there, but I hope I will get them today. And then you will see the announcement of those seminars. That's all for today. Thank you for coming and goodbye. Thanks everyone.